All right, great interview for you guys today again. What other kind of interview do we have on the Young Turks? You crazy? All right, so it's gonna be with Mark Leibovich. If you haven't read his book, This Town, you really ought to. I mean, if you like the Young Turks, it's exactly the kind of book that you'll learn a lot from and I think really enjoy. It's This Town, Two Parties and a Fuel, plus plenty of valet parking in America's gilded capital. It's about Washington, D.C. To give you a sense of why you like the book, the second chapter is called Suck Up City. And it shows how everybody in that uh, town likes to suck up uh, to other folks. Uh, now, Mark's won the National Magazine Award. Uh, Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg has called him Washington's most important journalist. That sounds pretty fun. Uh, and I and, and I like this title. The New Republic said he was among the 25 most powerful but least famous people. <laughs> so that's fun. All right, Mark. I can handle that. <laughs> Mark, thanks for joining us on the Young Turks. Appreciate it, man. Jack, my my pleasure. So, look, this is a book near and dear to my heart because it goes towards what I've been saying a long time on the show that, you know, it, it's really, in a sense, the ugly word for it is corruption. Um, uh, the prettier word, in a sense, is sucking up, right? You're sucking up to the people who are in right. power, uh, people who have money, uh, people who are going to be lobbyists, right. etc. But for the people who haven't right. read the book, first, let's just give us the essence of, of what you wrote about and then we'll get into the details. Sure. I mean, Suck Up City, to be honest, was. was sort of a working title for the whole book, and I came really close to naming the whole thing Suck Up City, because it really did give you know people a sense of, of what I was trying to say and where I was coming from. I mean, at, at the last minute, I decided I have, I have young kids. It seemed a little crass. Didn't know if people would be reading that on the Acela. I mean, it's not that bad, but, no, but it does capture the essence of, of a culture here in which sucking up is really as basic to the atmosphere as, as oxygen. And, and sucking up, which obviously um, implies sycophanticness, but also the sucking up of people into a culture and sucking things up and just sort of accepting the, the gilded, decadent reality as it is here, and, and then sort of being sucking out like nutrients of money in, from the system that, that ultimately changes people and, and ultimately is a, a system that's quite uh, corrupt, but, but ultimately is also very, very comfortable if you live here. And I, and I think what I try to do with, with this town is, is really incorporate over a four or five year period the degree to which the media has been sucked into all this and the degree to which the ruling class here and the revolving door here has involved the media, which you know, theoretically should be a watchdog, but, but so often just is sucked into the same celebrity mod that, um, that that's come to define the city. So Mark, it's, it's interesting because in the book you, you talk about the incestuous relationship between the media and the government and at the same time all the people in government who can't wait to become lobbyists and get super rich and how that right. obviously leads to an unhealthy uh, environment that isn't gonna necessarily get to the best policy for the average citizen. Uh, yet when the book right. came out, I. I thought maybe there was going to be a lot of you know blowback from it, and you know your chief national yeah, so correspondent, yeah, chief national correspondent for the New York Times Magazine. I thought you might have issues, et cetera. But it seemed like people were like, sure. "Oh yeah, yeah, you're pretty much right," and who cares? Yeah, I mean that's almost it, it was sort of disconcerting in some ways. I mean I was expecting more of a fight and more of an argument, which um, I, frankly I thought would have been healthy. I mean there was there was really no one that rose to the defense of this way of life that I described. And uh, that was surprising. I, I think you know, there were some people who actually were pretty aggrieved that I didn't mention them at all, because they figured, well, I mean, if I'm in this book, I have to be somebody, right? But um, no, I mean, I think the, 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 the saving grace of all this is once you got beyond the sort of inside the beltway read of this thing, which focused so much on the who wins and who loses and the gossip and the you know, just the, the little tidbits. Um, people actually outside of town really read it, and, and the reaction was real, you know, seemingly provocation. And, and, and the single most you know, common question I've gotten from people is, is it really that bad, and uh, what can we do about it? So I, I was heartened by that. But no, I mean, th this is, I mean, I was, I was thinking, what am I doing here? Am I, like, throwing my career away, and I'm naming names, I'm, I'm writing stuff that is not supposed to be written, I am violating the unwrote, unspoken rule that, that insiders of Washington aren't supposed to speak critically and publicly about other insiders of Washington. And you know, I sort of threw it all out there and um, held my breath and, and nothing really happened except that people read it and people seemed to like it. So that was good. So that's interesting. I, I, one quote that uh, stuck with me was something that Elizabeth Warren said. 
uh, about a meeting she had with um, Larry Summers, where Larry Summers told her, hey, look, the key to being an insider is that you don't talk shit about other insiders, right? Is that true? Now, was that in her memoir? Yes. It was that in her, that, because, you know, people have recommended that memoir as a very good political memoir. I mean, most political memoirs suck um, and are not worth reading. Um, but as a public service, one of the things I did in, in writing this book was reading a whole bunch of rotten memoirs so no one else has to, but I extracted the most um, embarrassing things from them. Um, but no, I, that's an amazingly astute point, and I think it goes right to the core of, of what I'm trying to say, which is, again, it's a very, I mean, Washington has this, this reputation as being a really tough town, right? It'll, it'll chew you up and spit you out, but um, yeah, the opposite's true. I mean, it's a very comfortable town. I mean, it's also the wealthiest metropolitan area in the United States, and um, look, I mean, this is not supposed to be as easy and as comfortable as it's become. You know, it, it really resonated with me because that's pretty much the same speech I got at MSNBC. You know, hey, be really? cool. Yeah. And I, I literally got a call uh -huh. one day outside of the big speech I got about how you have to, you know, toe the line for the establishment. Uh, on a separate uh -huh. note, I got a call saying, hey, Joe Scarborough is part of the team, so you don't criticize him, right? Mm -hmm. And so, right. Right. so, you know, this is the same old game that's played. But what's interesting to me is that, you know, if you look at, if you actually read your book, I mean, you're pretty tough on guys like Evan Bai. How are you oh, still friends God. with? Yeah, I, no, look, and I'm not friends with Evan Bai. I've never <laughs> been friends with Evan Bai. I mean, I don't want to be friends with Evan Bai. I mean, you know, I mean, he's maybe he's a nice guy or anything. No, I mean, no, I mean, first of all, one, one mistake that a lot of journalists in Washington make is that they think that you know their self worth accrues to their job titles. They think people are being so nice to them because they're like wonderfully smart and charming people. But no, I mean, the vast majority of quote unquote friendships that, that bubble up in Washington are because people think it's, it's necessary, it's transactional. And um, no, I mean, I, I've covered a lot of politicians, I've profiled, you know, probably hundreds of them over the years. And, um, you know, I get along fine with a lot of them, I enjoy a lot of them, and, and, you know, it's cool that I guess they would recognize me in restaurants, but I don't think for a second that they're my friends. I mean, we, we have a job to do, and I think a lot of people forget that. So how, how about the other media uh, people that you talked about here? And it, it, look, maybe Politico was happy that they got mentioned so many times, but, but, if, you, <laughs> but if you're actually yeah. reading it and paying attention, it's fairly devastating indictment of them. You know, I, a lot of people thought so. I mean, I don't know what they thought. I mean, what's interesting about them is they do seem to be extremely ambitious and yet not have any illusions that they're that they're really making the world a better place. I mean, they, their mission is to be the ESPN for politics and to really appeal to, to political junkies, which is a pretty shallow construction. And, and um, so, I mean, you know, and at the end of the day, I mean, they do a pretty good job of it, and I'm a political junkie, and I read them. But ultimately, this is not sports, right? These are not games. This is for keeps. And um, I don't think they have any interest whatsoever in, in the sort of nuance of day-to-day of -day America and how what goes on here affects that. So the, it, that really gets to the central question here, because, you know, look, there's a lot of parts in the book where I thought exactly, exactly, you know, it, the stuff you mentioned about Evan Bias, the stuff we did, you know, on the days that those right. events happen, you can go back and watch our right. videos on those, right? And I remember when Andrew yeah. Breitbart passed away, there was a lot of accolades for him because he was considered such a good player within this uh, system, this ecosystem, right? Right. Uh, but right. And, and I just interviewed Andrew uh, like two weeks before he passed away, and, uh, and he had pretty much admitted on air that he doesn't really believe some of the things that he does, but he does it as provocation. Uh, but right. after he passed away, so the problem is like it isn't a game. If it was a game, then, right. then I would say hats off. Yes, he got great media attention, yeah. he got results, he got right. people fired, etc. But the people he got fired, right. it's not a game to them, right? And it's not a game right. when you affect policy and affect millions of people. But it seems to me the overwhelming message I get from your description of what happens in Washington is they don't seem altogether that concerned about the people that they affect. They, to them, it does appear like an irrelevant game with no consequence. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's a fun game. It's a very lucrative game if you're playing it and if you're visible. And, um, I mean, quite often it's just play acting. I mean, the, the economy of Washington, you know, depends in many ways, in, in, in many parts, on, on things not getting done. I mean, if an immigration bill passed tomorrow, if a tax reform bill passed tomorrow, I mean, that's, you know, 
hundreds of billions of dollars, maybe, or tens of billions of dollars in lobbying fees and consulting fees that aren't going to be paid out. And, and essentially, the city thrives on on divisiveness, and not to mention cable, TV, and, and blogs, and a lot of the media organisms. And, and frankly, a lot of the people who are yelling at each other on TV are the same ones who are cutting deals together and going into lobbying businesses together at um, at you know in the green room after after the show's over or during the show or whatever. So it, it's a very 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 kind of disingenuous racket that I think people outside of this town don't have a really full understanding of. I mean, I think they have a pretty shallow understanding of, you know, the town that doesn't work so well. But in fact, it works very, very well for the people who are here. So let's talk about the results of that corruption, because I think ultimately the most important thing is, like, let's take Politico as an example. Look, they want to cover politics like ESPN. I, a, I have no problem with that. B, I, I love politics. I mean, I, I, I love right. the... The nitty gritty of it, the details, the the deals you got to cut, etc. I'm fascinated by. It. That's why I went into this business, right? But to me, that isn't the real issue. The, the real issue is that they put not just a thumb, but their their whole body on the scale on the side of people who are paying them, right? The advertisers, the corporations, the chamber of commerce. Etc. And I, I just use Politico as an example. I mean, it happens throughout the town, whether it's politicians, whether it's the media, etc. So, right. the result of that seems to be significant to massive corruption, where they're not really doing the bidding of whether it's the readers in the media, their viewers on TV, or their constituents to, when it comes to politicians. Yeah, I mean, look, they, they would, I assume, you know, reject that premise wholeheartedly. I mean, I, I do think that, that really the, the bias that people at Politico, and frankly a lot of mainstream, I mean, mainstream is probably a bad word, but you know, the, a lot of the, the political reporters working here have is to the game itself. It's to the notion of winning and losing. It's to the notion of keeping themselves in business and keeping themselves on, and getting themselves on, on TV. I mean, I, I think, look, I mean, there have been some, I mean, I, I get wherever I go as a New York Times reporter, I mean, there are people on both sides who assume either I am being censored by the corporate media or I'm carrying water for the left because we're the liberal New York Times. Um, you know, speaking for my own self and my own paper, I mean, it, it, I've never had anyone uh, come over and say, "Hey, this is this is our plan and this is our agenda today, and this is who we're going to favor today." I mean, if I did, I'd, I'd quit in a heartbeat. And look, I mean, I think there are a lot of good reporters at, at Politico, so I wouldn't I wouldn't tar them with that brush fully. I mean, I think you know. They've been suspected of that, but I, I don't really have any proof for that. But I think that, um, look, I, I do think that the bias is towards insiderdom. It's a, sort of a pack mentality that, that leads to some very, very dangerous misconceptions like, you know, there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Let's go to war. Or, you know, America's not ready for a black president. Or Hillary Clinton is inevitable. Or, you know, I mean, Obamacare is a purely political notion. It has nothing to do with, say, technology. I mean, these, the, the misconceptions that bubble up here, like all the time, because of this mentality and this bias towards, you know, politics and, and sort of treating it as a mainstream sport, I think can be very, very destructive. So, Mark, let's get into that conversation because there, I don't know that I totally agree with you. I, I, I think that uh, that it's not an accident. That, that I think that it's not a conspiracy either. Nobody's in a smoke-filled room, right? right? Uh, but the right. system, through the well, weight no one of smokes it. Anymore. <laughs> That's the other problem, right? Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> right. Through the weight of its incentives and disincentives, go, has set up a system of corruption where, in the end, the Chamber of Commerce is going to win, right? And it. Uh, and, and depressing. So, you could be right. You know, look, it, it certainly the, the, the scales are tilted to, to, towards those interests every single day. Yeah, and so as I look at that, I think, well, you know. They read your book and they think, oh, did I get quoted enough? And it's like it, the system's gotten, and the people within the system have gotten so jaded that they think it's perfectly okay to go and be a lobbyist for a multinational corporation yep. and argue on their behalf, full well knowing in a lot of the instances, not in every instance, but in a lot of the instances, that that's going to be against the interests of the American people. And they think, so what? I'm getting paid. And that has become regular course of business in Washington. That's not a little disconcerting. That's that's a massive problem oh, with our oh, democracy. It's it's a huge problem. I mean, you know, look. I mean, fifty percent of all U.S. Re retired U.S. senators now go right into lobbying. I mean, that that compares to three percent of U.S. senators going into lobbying in 1974. Um, 
I mean, it does make you wonder who are these people working for when they are actually in office. Um, I mean, I mean, not to mention, you know, people like you know, Richard Gephardt or you know Evan Bayh or Trent Lott or you know, I mean, John Bro is Trent Lott's um, lobbying partner, uh, who was once called a cheap whore, and he said. Um, I'm not that cheap, and um, you might say I can be bought, but I can be rented. But I, I can't be bought, but I can be rented. So, no, look, it, it's it's endless, and you do have to wonder. I mean, no one goes home anymore. I mean, the, the sort of notion that the founders put in place that people were going to come to Washington and serve their country and then return home to their farms and serve their communities at their general stores or their medical practice or whatever, I mean, that's been thrown out the window. I mean, if you get elected to Congress, if you get a big staff job, if you get you know, to be visible um, somewhere in Washington, you basically can punch a lottery ticket for life. I mean, you think Eric Cantor is going to be um, starving anytime soon? I mean, everyone's feeling sorry for him now. I, I'm guessing he'll be making well into seven figures very, very, very shortly after he leaves Congress. You know, right after he lost, there's all this speculation about, oh, he's going to do a, a writing you know, campaign as, you know, Murkowski right. did in Alaska. I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. No, he's semi ecstatic <laughs> that he lost. He, he's going to go I make know. millions of dollars. He couldn't Our be happier Goldman, with this. Goldman Sachs, you know, Alston Bird, Patton Boggs. You know, no, he, he's uh, actually I was thinking about writing a column and just calling it Congratulations, Eric Cantor. Um, <laughs> totally. I mean, look, it, it's, it's a very, um, I mean, look, Jay Carney, I mean, the White House press secretary, whose job is basically to, you know, sort of obfuscate every day for an hour, and he's pretty good at it. And, I mean, look, he, he served the president, he served the press, he would say, and, and now he's basically set for life. I mean, I, I would be shocked if someone like Jay, I mean, yeah, because of the opportunities afforded to people in that position now, um, are not able to, to, you know, essentially make a whole lot of money because that's sort of the celebrity culture that's invaded Washington and, and politics generally. So before we get to how we fix this, I gotta, you mentioned the Obama administration there, so I gotta go down that path for a second. So President Obama ran on the idea of change. And I remember the one line that really sticks out to me in the 2008 campaign where he said, I don't wanna play the same old Washington games a little better, I wanna change the game, right? The way that it's played. Yeah. And, and that was in the, if you remember in the ad called Billy about Billy Tauzin, who's a perfect example of all the things that you talk about in the book, right? right. So, right. so then uh, President Obama has done almost nothing to change the way that the game is played. So right. what, what do you think happened there? I mean, here's a guy that you describe in the book as dismissive of the political types and the day-to-day -day machinations of Washington, and then they become engulfed in it. And all the change right. placards instead of get put away, and they never bother doing any of that. So what in the world happened? Yeah. Well, you know, it's just not clear to me how hard he tried. I mean, I, I will say that, you know, he certainly ran in a very effective campaign. It certainly captured the imagination of, of a lot of people. Um, and look, I mean, you get to be president. It's a very reactive job, potentially. And it's, it's a job that's obviously huge and, and unfathomably complicated and pressure-packed and all of that. So, um, but I don't know. I don't know if he was ever serious. I think what happens is, I mean, you know, essentially presidents are surrounded by staff people who are very much part of this Washington culture and very much playing the game of the revolving door. And, um, you know, they made all these promises, no lobbyists in the White House. And, you know, and then they got into the White House and there was, there was this exception and that exception and that exception. And, you know, they said, we're not going to ever opt out of the campaign finance system. And then, oh, lo and behold, we're raising a lot of money. Let's opt out of the campaign finance system. I mean, uh, we're not going to work with super PACs. Lo and behold, they're going to work with super PACs. I mean, so, Look, I mean, it looks like sort of rank opportunism of the highest order. It's also, look, I mean, they're allowed to change their mind. They're allowed to lie to us, and I'm allowed to be cynical. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's funny we get surprised, and we've been trying to figure out President Obama for the last five, six years. But he's a great politician who got elected president of the United States twice. Rank opportunism sure. sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. No, look, it's a, it's a good it's a good career quality here. Obviously, I mean, look, I mean, being president of the United States is obviously not a job for mortals, and I, I don't you know pretend to to know anyone who who feels that they could do it or do it well. Um, and look, he's he's obviously he's got a lot on his head and a lot on his plate. So I, I certainly would never want to diminish that. But but sure, the ideal and the 
and the promises of 2008 seem very, very far away right now. And, and you know, I guess change you can believe in in, in 2016 is a return to the Clinton years, potentially. So, um, <laughs> you know, I don't think that's terribly exciting either. <laughs> no, to say the least. And now I'm on Twitter, I'm being accused of... Uh, you know, speaking out against uh, Democrats and how dare I do that? I'm just going to hurt the Democratic Party. What? Okay, so how dare you do that? Sir? Yeah, I know. How, I'm like, well, I'm. You I know, don't. We, we, we got to play on the right team here. Exactly. I'm like, I, I don't know if you know this. I'm not on your team. <laughs> I'm on the. Uh, yeah, I'm not either. <laughs> right. I'm not on Team Democrat. I'm not on Team. I've been fired, not fired, but shooed away for not being on Team Democrat. So, um, yeah. so then let's get to how in the world do we fix this intractable problem? Okay, you want to take a shot at it? <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, you know, look, I, I, I think I, I would say that it's not as unfixable as people think. I mean, I think if you look at recent history, um, you know, the power of the grassroots, I think, is still extremely, extremely massive, especially in this age of the internet. I mean, I think you know the, the Obama '08 campaign. Uh, even the Tea Party of 2010, right? I mean, th these are all grassroots movements that, 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 you know, affected some pretty serious power, um, you know, turnover in, in Washington. And, and I think, look, I think it's very important, and this is going to sound self-serving, but I think it's also true in many cases. I mean, it's important to inject shame into the system. I mean, I think one of the reasons I wanted to write this book and I wanted people to read this book is because I want people to feel shame. I want there to you know, at least be part of the conversation that, look, you're not here to cash in. You are here to serve. And then maybe, just maybe, you'll leave. Um, I, I do think that, that look, I, I think when you go across the country, um, there is still a very, very sort of basic core of idealism here. And, and I think, you know, I think the country is wide open to some kind of third-party candidate if, if one comes along. I think it's certainly wide open to campaign finance reform. I think it's certainly wide open to you know, some kind of, if, if not legally mandated term limits, you know, maybe voluntarily mandated term limits, at least getting this into the conversation that, that the system is just really corrupt and just helping people understand that and, and helping to demand, you know, change in every election, not just when, when it's the, oper when it's the um, you know, when the flavor of the month in, in whatever campaign is coming before us. Look, you know, I, I think voting, of course, is important when it gets to election day, but to me, it's not nearly as important as change we can believe in, right? So, you know, Hillary Clinton, I mean, are you kidding me? She's going to give you change? You're waiting for a magical figure who's so engrossed in the establishment and she's going to somehow go against the establishment? People like think Barack Obama hates this system and that's why he was going to change. No, the system made him president. He loves the system, right? right? It made him the most powerful yeah. man on earth. And so, yeah. so to me, the idea is if you don't get the money out of politics, you don't end the unlimited contributions that these politicians can get. I mean, if you got unlimited contributions from someone, you'd be tempted to serve them too, right? So yeah. Well, look, you get, you get to. I mean, Barack Obama. I mean, he might have changed Washington. Might not have changed Washington, but he he did a heck. I mean, you know, he he did a lot. He would say that he did a lot. He appointed Supreme Court justices. This is. You know, many would say is, is extremely significant compared to what a Republican might have done in the same situation or not have done in the same situation. So, yeah, I mean, there's no one that's going to, you know, disavow the power of, of the office. But I do, look, I, I do think that, especially Democrats, I mean, presidents are always going to disappoint. I mean, the, 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 another one of the single most common questions I get, especially when I travel these days, is, so what's Elizabeth Warren like and is she going to run? I mean, there is there is an appetite for... I think some kind of outsider, especially in the Democratic Party, but also in the Republican Party, um, that people can really get excited about. And I guarantee you, if, if lightning strikes again and someone like that gets into the White House, there will be great disappointment after a few years, and because that's sort of the nature of the beast. But again, I mean, at the power of the grassroots can, can definitely affect change. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the lessons of this book is that, that Washington does, you know, kicking and screaming, respond mostly to self-interest. I mean, no one would be talking about immigration or gun control if that didn't start at the grassroots. So, um, And if Republicans, you know, didn't think it was in their self-interest to sort of get religion on it or at least get serious about it, and unclear if they will, but that's, you know, part of the equation. So I'm with you. I think that there's going to be definitely a populist on the Democratic side, and they're going to yeah. catch Hillary and everybody's going to be shocked. 
as if it didn't happen already eight years ago, right? Like, yeah, well, I've already right. seen I mean, that the, movie. The, the missing ingredient is like the next Barack Obama. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, who who knows if he or she is sitting out there? Or if you know, I don't. Elizabeth Warren yeah. is that person or whoever? You know, I I don't know if Elizabeth Warren's that person either. I think she might be. I hope so, et cetera. But. But I don't think it requires a Barack Obama and magical political skills. I think it requires someone saying, uh, I think the bankers should have gone to jail. And I can't believe the corruption yeah. in Washington. And the bankers got away with it. Boom, right there. Yeah, not to mention, like, someone actually running, I mean, you know, front and center on campaign finance reform. I mean, John McCain almost got the Republican nomination in 2000 on, on that singular message. Right? Well, that's exactly how Eric Cantor lost in the primary. Uh, the, the guy running against him, far right yeah. uh, Republican, said, I, sh I would put the bankers in jail. I mean, it's the same thing that we agree with, right? Thinking of it purely politically, it would be such a winning issue. And it's, you know, it gets people so riled up, and rightly, it's an outrage what goes on here. Yeah, and, and I saw a great quote about this. I, I'm sorry, I forget which senator said it, but they said something to the effect of like, why do you think we don't use it in our campaigns when we know it would work well? It's because then we would lose our donors. Uh, I wonder if that's really true. I mean, are there really people sitting out there, and I guess there obviously are, but who think, well, I mean, it's so good that the super PACs are here to protect us and serve our interests. I mean, I guess there probably are because, you know, they are the super PACs and they represent, you know, their interests. But um, it's really quite amazing that, that no one has taken it on to the degree that, that certainly you could. I mean, there's just some real, real outrage waiting to be tapped on that issue, I think. Yeah, and, and I think it can be ironically done on a presidential level if uh, even, oh, though, yeah. even though you couldn't do it maybe on a congressional level or on a Senate level because on the mm -hmm. presidential level you get so much free press that you could then yep. fundraise from small donors in a way that would make up losing right. your Wall Street donors, your super back donors, etc. Right? right? So Right, I mean in a sense Obama did that. Right. I mean, Obama. I mean, you know, he talked a very good game about campaign finance, especially early on. And then, well, you know, and he, he leveraged the internet, and you know, he didn't he didn't follow through on much. I don't know. Again, I don't know how hard he tried, but it was a very, um, you know, it was a very potent strategy for him, and it, as it was for McCain in 2000. Well, look, we're trying our best here. We don't just run the Young Turks. We got a uh, we uh, started a super PAC to kill all the other super PACs. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's a super it, super PAC. Yeah, right. It's called Wolf Pack. And uh, we're trying to pass it. Wolfpack, I like it. Yeah, it's, we're trying to pass the 28th Amendment uh, to get rid of corporate personhood and do public financing of all elections so you can get money out. And, uh, and, and they tell me that I'm not supposed to do that because you're not supposed to mix activism with uh, being in the media. Uh, somebody's got to do it. I won't tell anyone. Okay, good. All right, our se your secret's safe with me. <laughs> okay, excellent. All right, well, look, the, the reason uh, I love your book is at least shines a light onto that issue and gives very specific examples of exactly how that business is conducted in Washington. So, everybody, check out This Town by Mark Leibovich. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Really appreciate it.